We will start with our next panel. It's a great pleasure for me to be moderating the discussion on a very hot topic, as a lot of other energy-related topics we had today. But we are talking about infrastructure and a very crucial infrastructure that in our region can also contribute and help towards uh, Europe's energy security and energy independence. We will be mentioning uh, cross-border pipelines like the IGB. Uh, we uh, will discuss about the FSLU project in Alexandrupolis, LNG, uh, the, the LNG and the natural gas dynamics, generally speaking. And of course, we will touch upon uh, the EU policy, the latest developments and uh, what should we be expecting next uh, in the midst of this uh, energy crisis. And uh, I couldn't have uh, you know, the best uh, speakers uh, in, in, in our panel to discuss about this topic. Uh, I will start with Ms. Maria Spiraki, member of the European Parliament. Uh, member of a number of uh, committees, also in the Energy Committee, the uh, spokesman for the RED uh, in, in, in the uh, European Commission, and uh, uh, with uh, her uh, very, uh, let's say, deep involvement and knowledge in the European Parliament with all these energy-related developments that we have had over the past year or so. Uh, I would like to, to start with a question immediately to, to hear how should we be uh, expecting the developments in the energy crisis? And we saw there was a ministerial um, uh, meeting uh, this day and today in, uh, in Brussels. There's a lot of discussion about uh, having a cap to natural gas prices, either from uh, only sourced from uh, Russia or from any other source, uh, pipe gas uh, in, in particular. Uh, so what is your view on that? And uh, uh, what do you, or what should we be expecting next? Thank you, Professor Andriosopoulos. Thank you for having me to this very interesting and very timely debate. It is an honor for me to, to contribute to this, starting with, uh, needless to say, we face a huge delay coming from the Commission on the issue of adapting a, a part of measures that they have been tabled since last March. So we lost time. But it's not only that, we have some, some achievements that we have to consider. And the first one is, of course, the diversification of our supply starting with replacement of uh, supply from Russia by 40 percent at the beginning of the crisis, at the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And now we have 9 percent natural gas supply coming from Russia. We compensate it with uh, importing gas, LNG, particularly from United States, Norway, Azerbaijan and Algeria. But the case, according to my opinion, is also that we made another significant step forward, which is the platform from for a voluntary joint procurement. It is something that is working because we are now the biggest, allow me to say, by a cartel in the world. And so the EU as an entity can have uh, the, the quantity of natural gas that is needed. But we don't tackle, we don't answer the main question, the fundamental question, which is the balance between supply and demand. And the commission, the blueprint that has, has been already published uh, during last week by the, the, the president of the commission also for the line, was not answering to this question. Was not answering to this question because the proper answer is not only to reduce the demand. The number one num uh, measure that the commission is proposing, the, the, the so-called cap to, to Russian gas input, does not make any sense. Does not make any sense. Because it is only 9% of our imports of natural gas, as I have already said now. Secondly, because it will violate uh, the existing contracts, meaning that we are giving uh, uh, Putin and Russia the alibi to, to, to stop, to halt the, the supplies to Europe. And of course, it doesn't make sense in terms of prices. I think that discussing on caps, we have to understand, to consider about a, a broader cap meaning that it will be put in place to all inputs coming to the EU, meaning to all inputs coming to the EU in terms of gas, coming from Norway, coming from the US, coming from Algeria. And it, it will be something brave. It will work if we finally decide to adapt the price, meaning a price like the, the ASEAN price and putting some kind of, of surplus, maybe five or more percent. It will, it will work also because it finally affects the way that we are having the pricing. And of course, we need to consider other measures, like start working on the issue of amending the model of electricity prices. And it is not something that it is work as well. It is something that it has been established during the period of peace, during the period of supplies. Now we are in well. We face two issues that I would like to, to focus on, and I would like to conclude with this. The number one issue is the, the, the danger 
of uh, facing a systemic uh, problem due to the issues of liquidity of the companies that they are involved in the market of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the energy. And this, it is important to say that in this regard, the proposals, the blueprint coming from the Commission is in the right direction because they will give finally a kind of facility in order to increase the liquidity of such companies. The second issue that we face, and I would like to focus on as a politician, is the danger on the issue of raising populism. We have elections in Italy, we have elections in Sweden. We have to understand that there is no easy solutions, but at the same time, we have to consider that prices are soaring and not they are not affordable, not only for the, uh, for, for the end users, meaning the industry, but also for, for the householders. We have to, to, to speed up. We have to work upon this. The, the Prime Minister of Belgium has already made a, a proposal today in political, saying that we have to proceed with a broader cap. It is something that we also consider in the Greek government, and I think that it's now time to act now. Thank you very much. The issue of speed also from the uh, response of the European Commission and the European Union has been uh, mentioned many, many times also with the uh, happening of uh, you know the COVID crisis a couple of years ago. Um, now I'm moving to our next speaker, Olga Kakova. She's the Deputy Director for the European Energy Security at Global Energy Center of the Atlantic Council. So coming from the other side of the Atlantic, how uh, uh, do you see all these infrastructure projects in the Southeast Europe, which I know that you have been following closely over the past uh, few years? And uh, what is your view in uh, the midst of this energy crisis for Europe uh, of uh, you know the, the role that the U.S. can play uh, and not only with the U.S. Uh, LNG supplies that uh, we all uh, discuss about, but uh, at other levels that uh, you could consider, let's say, significant uh, to this extent. Thank you so much. Um, great question. So when the Southern you know, Gas Corridor first opened up, you know, please uh, open your apologies. microphone. Apologies. Uh, when you know the initial spur of the Southern Gas Corridor was opened up, uh, it was such a missed opportunity to have additional interconnections throughout the region. I mean, you could just look at the map and you're just wondering, there's this amazing pipeline, and why is it not integrated with the rest of the region? So that was just one example of kind of some of the missed opportunities which are being fixed right now. We're seeing just a slew of projects, both LNG. You know, we're seeing U.S. cargoes coming in and actually having enough supply and the prices of for U.S. cargoes actually being lower than some of the piped and not sufficient infrastructure. We've, you know, we've seen that recently uh, to be able to anticipate that and absorb that through Europe. So all of that is being fixed. You know, I don't want to go into too many details, but I'll mention a couple of, you know, projects because we've had a whole day where we were able to dive into the different infrastructure and where all these projects are. Um, you know, we're seeing the Serbia bulgaria interconnector, the Polish-Slovakia interconnector, the uh, LNG terminals here, and another one that, uh, that will be opening up uh, hopefully in the near future, Kirk, you know, the polish Svinaurse. All of this creates this new south-north corridor of interconnections that historically was very much dominated with the east-west relationship and very much a one-way street where energy just flew, uh, energy uh, was flowing west. Um, and now, even, even today, these interconnections are utilized in a very dynamic way. There's reverse flows. Um, you know, the energy markets are picking up and it's, it's a new environment. So uh, just a quick summary in terms of, you know, your question on the longer kind of the longer term outlook for this and making sure that this fits in with the climate goals. You know, I think these projects, are, you know, three, three points there. Uh, first of all, anytime you're switching from Russian gas uh, on the data that we have right now, you're already even just going with U.S. or other uh, producers, you're already reducing emissions right there, just because other producers do a much better diligence at uh, tracking emissions, being transparent, and making the effort to reduce emissions all along the supply chain. Are they perfect? Are they, uh, you know, as good as they can be in reducing methane? They're getting there. There's still tons of opportunities along the way. The biggest difference is that these producers are, are making that effort to where Russia has really doubled down, even before the conflict, even in the last, in the last decade, they've really placed all of their bet on Look, the energy transition is going to take much longer. Europe and U.S. and other countries around the world are going to just really be delayed in their energy transition. So it's okay for us to wait as well. So that was kind of the, the outlook, the strategy that Russia took. Uh, and they doubled down on just saying, you know what, we're going to produce as cheaply as much as possible without really taking the long outlook on what does it look to decarbonize their industry and their economy. So that was, that was the bet that they placed. 
Um, and then third, of course, looking into the creative solutions for this infrastructure for the future. So, uh, we're seeing some really exciting discussions about even contracts on how to integrate things like hydrogen blending into towards the end of, or maybe the last five to 10 years of a contract, potentially. We're looking into um, specific things being included about carbon intensity or saying, we can see some companies are even offering net zero LNG for, you know, maybe not right away, but saying the last 10 years of, a con of the contract, here's how much we can guarantee that we'll reduce your carbon intensity. So this is new and exciting. I mean, these are, these are serious obligations and, you know, they are contractual obligations. So that means that the, the industry is thinking forward about how to make sure that we pursue climate and energy security goals in tandem. So, Thank you very much, Olga. I move now to our next speaker, Mr. Kostis Sifneus, Managing Director of Gas Trade. Gas Trade, the, the developer behind the project, uh, one of the hottest projects, infrastructure projects in the, in the area, which I would say now, the LNG terminal in uh, Alexandropolis. Uh, it's been uh, many years, and this is, I'm, I'm mentioning that just as a reminder to everybody and all the voices also in the EU that uh, infrastructure, energy infrastructure takes time to be developed and constructed. And uh, we started with that uh, at the uh, conference. Uh, Mr. Bagatellos mentioned it as well. Our first Southeast Europe Energy Conference was in Alexandropolis six years ago. So uh, 2017, indeed. And the uh, floor is yours. And uh, you know, you, you can tell us a few words about. I mean, my question is, where are we now with the FSRU? Uh, what is the? If you can tell us a few words about uh, the success of the first uh, capacity booking of the. Uh, first unit, and uh, what is the plan perhaps for the second unit that we already mm -hmm. hear about? Thank you, Kostas, and uh, thanks to the uh, Greek American Chamber of Commerce and the Hellenic Association of, uh, of Energy Economics. Uh, indeed, this is the sixth one. We started from Alexandropolis in 2017. Um, so, congratulations for keeping up that momentum here. Um, now, what we we'll talk about. Um, energy dependence. Uh, let me try to move this. Um, so, 50% of the uh, gas which flows in the south in Europe, southeastern Europe um, used to be Russian gas. So, when we're looking about independence in this area, we're looking at new infrastructures. Uh, that need to be put in place to diversify the supply and, and the routes uh, for energy in this area. Um, and, and these new infrastructures need to be in place uh, as soon as possible. So time is, is of critical uh, importance here. Um, as we see the, the, the landscape today, there are only two infrastructures which are um, independent of, uh, um, uh, let's say, Russian gas, and, and one is TAP, and the other one is, is uh, Revithusa terminal. But, but realistically, if we, if we take into consideration the root dependency, the, the only really independent infrastructure is, is, is Revithusa, so it's the LNG terminal. So um, this is... Um, a strategic position that the Alexandropolis Energy Terminal is coming uh, to uh, enhance uh, and to strengthen so that the region uh, um, becomes really more independent and more diversified on, on its uh, supply sources and its supply routes. Um, but um, the, the important thing is here that when, when you actually build infrastructure, this, these infrastructures need, need to communicate, need to talk to each other. Uh, and we think that uh, Alexandropolis LNG Terminal is the most important uh, um, new infrastructure which is currently being implemented, uh, but it is also very important to ensure that all these uh, existing and new infrastructures uh, work together in complementarity, uh, work effectively and efficiently. Um, and, and it's not only 
about um, IGB. I think it's about all the existing and, and new infrastructure that will be built in this in this region, so that we make sure that supplies can reach as as far as possible into the um, uh, south north uh, direction. Um, in, in this way, we can actually support the, the consolidation, the liquidity in the markets, and we can eventually uh, achieve the independence. Uh, but, but for this to be done, we need, um, we need to make sure that these uh, infrastructures are built on time and they are supported by efficient uh, regulatory structures which allow them to operate together. Um, in, in that respect, I think there is one partnership of projects in this region, mm -hmm. but, but also Alexandropolis is, is a strong alliance. It's, it's, a part, it's a partnership and alliance of um, key stakeholders in the region, uh, which have come together to develop this project and, and to reach out for the, for the region. And it's not only... Uh, um, uh, stakeholders from Greece, but there's stakeholders from from the region. Um, I have two on my left, um, and so it's Bulgaria, but it's also interest from from uh, other markets, um, from North Macedonia, who are um, interested uh, in joining uh, this effort, um, from Romania, from Serbia. Uh, from the entire region. And it's not only about the stakeholders, but it's, I'll come back to that one last, um, but it's also about a partnership of leaders. Um, it's about the, um, the strategic and, and geopolitical importance uh, of the project that, that brings together um, all these states um, cooperating around energy. Now, on your question regarding um, time, uh, persistence is one thing uh, I think needs to be mentioned here. You posters know that we started this project already in 2010. So it has gone through different phases. I'm not going to go in detail. And, and it has progressed to where it is now, where we have taken the, the FID in uh, January this year, um, we have all the construction contracts signed and executed. We have achieved financial close, and we're moving towards implementation. Key milestones going forward, uh, February 2023, uh, the FSIU will enter the yard for its, its conversion. Um, March 2023, we signed the pipeline lane preparatory works as going on as we speak um november 2023 we expect to have uh, the connection uh, with uh, the desfa system with esfa um, uh, in place and uh, the fsiu will exit the yard and will be on site and then in december 2023 we should complete a commissioning and testing and, and start commercial operation uh, by the end of, of 2023. So this is where we are. These are the key milestones. Um, the project is progressing on plan, and we are um, hopeful um, that we will deliver as projected by the end of 2023. It's, it's, it's key for the entire area to get the project in place and running as soon as possible. Thank you, Kostis. Thank you for this uh, update on, on, on the project. I will uh, now move to Mr. Vladimir Malinov, the CEO of Ugar Transgas, uh, not only with the hat of a shareholder to the project that we have seen of uh, the FSRU in Alexandropolis, but as a CEO of the backbone, let's say, of the uh, natural gas system in, in Bulgaria, I would like to tell us uh, uh, how uh, the outlook of uh, the, um, the security of supply in Bulgaria looks like 
uh, in the coming months, especially with the winter coming uh, ahead of us, given that a couple of months ago, uh, Russia uh, has decided to, to cut off the supplies uh, for Bulgaria. And we have uh, uh, heard also Ambassador Tunis uh, mentioning this morning that indeed uh, Greece uh, has supported a lot Bulgaria through the very crucial infrastructure that is already in place. And uh, Maria Rita can tell us a little bit about that later on in uh, the terminal of uh, Revithusa, where uh, a lot of uh, ships now with uh, LNG uh, destined to, to Bulgaria have been coming through Greece. Thank you, Costa. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank the organizers that it's a real pleasure and honor. I'm honored to, to be for the second time part of this significant event. And maybe I had my presentation prepared, but I'll throw it away. I would like to, to start with something much more, more globally. Uh, these severe times, times of, times of war, showed us that we need to, to step very hard on the ground and to strengthen our belief that we have and we share common values that uh, we should have a uh, common approach and common vision and to take joint actions immediately. And this is a good, a good symbol that uh, we are right now here and uh, a far away of much more regional thinking and much more global thinking because not even single system in the countries could uh, work uh, as it is own and could secure secure the, the consumption and the deliveries of natural gas, but even not just for the region, much more broader picture. Then I'll give an example. When I joined Bulgaria Transgas in 2010, Bulgaria looked like a single isolated market, just one pipeline, which was delivering uh, uh, natural gas uh, to Bulgaria, 100% dependency and no alternatives at all. So at that time we started to, to develop and once again uh, together with the colleagues we had a, let's say marvelous relationship with, with DESFA even much more better now with the new management because we worked in the past also but also with the, all the TSOs uh, in the region and in the neighboring countries. So we started and nowadays uh, we were much more better prepared for, for the, you know, there's a famous saying in one of the movies, winter is coming. Maybe you know what movie I'm referring, series where I'm referring to. Uh, and we are much more better prepared from an infrastructural point of view, uh, the connectivity with, with this system, reverse flow, which was zero at even five, six years ago, and constantly we increased that, the, the technical capacity. Now having uh, something like six uh, and a half million cubic meters per day capacity, which allowed us even uh, three years ago to get the first LNG cargos uh, uh, to be introduced on the Bulgarian market. And now to have a constant, constant solution. Of course, uh, we were also clever enough and maybe we were visionaries when in 2018 we decided to, to join the gas trade uh, Alexandropol FSRU project. Because at that time, you saw the atmosphere wasn't, let's say, we were not so optimistic or we were, let's say, a little bit skeptical. Okay, what's this LNG? When it will be become, uh, from a price perspective, uh, competitive for the market? But we were visionaries and, uh, let's say, put that risk in the project and now we are proud of that. That, uh, that we did it. And uh, hopefully, not hopefully, it's on our shoulders, the project uh, to be introduced to the market and to be commercially operational by the 1st of January 2024. And there's a much more recent proof on that. It was mentioned by the Ambassador Mustafa on that. But uh, next week, the Bulgarian government will take, it's just a formal step, a decision that uh, Bulgaria will increase and will double the capacity uh, booked at Alexandropolis Terminal. So on top of that, we are working about this diversification also in, in a real sense, because speaking frankly, LNG to have, let's say, a full impact 
on the original market needs somewhere this gas to be stored because you know certain the terminals they have the limitation storage capacity the regasification so uh, from that perspective further on uh, we had with the support with the European Commission with the support with the United States uh, financial institutions we are developing the, the project for expansion of our gas storage which will really bring uh, uh, an added value to the LNG uh, for, for the region. And the expansion of the storage, together with the episodio uh, at Alexandropolis, they, they work in a good uh, symbiosis and, and synergy. So let's come back to what I started. So we have the, the common values, so no more dependency. We would like to be independent, like a region, uh, in concerning routes, sources. Secondly, uh, we have the plan how to do that, and we're implementing that. Just we need to urge ourselves and work together. And the actions are already taken. So we are much more better prepared, but the winter is coming. Thank you very much. So let's let's hope for the weather to bring us good news and uh, uh, try to have a soft winter uh, in our region. Uh, Maria Rita Gali is our next uh, speaker, CEO of DESPA. Uh, Maria Rita is, uh, has a good knowledge of the area, not only the industry, of course, but of the area, given that she has been working with the Senfluga Consortium, are following a very successful privatization process coming to, the, to, to DESPA. And since then, as I think it was uh, quite uh, obvious as well now that, uh, you know, the new management uh, of DESPA has brought, uh, uh, let's say, a, a new aura, positive aura in terms of, uh, you know, making things work and uh, moving and having some progress. And uh, I may have mentioned Alexandrupolis FSRU as the hottest new project, but the most visited industrial site uh, in, in the world uh, for the past month has been, uh, <laughs> has been the LNG terminal in uh, Revithusa. So, uh, if you can tell us a few words also in uh, connection to what Vladimir was saying about the role of DESPA now in this new era that we're living in, with uh, more LNG flows coming in and with uh, DESPA now having to play a role of more of an exporter uh, to, to the rest of the region rather than the importer that uh, used to be so far. Yeah. Thank you very much, Costas, and thank you again uh, to invite me for the second time to this uh, very important event. As you mentioned, export, uh, uh, I would like to give you some facts uh, that I think visually can give, uh, let's say, the perception of what is happening uh, uh, around the export from Greece to Bulgaria, what has been ha happening in the last few months. Um, and uh, the reality is that, uh, uh, let's say, since the moment uh, in which, of course, there has been an interruption of uh, uh, Russian supply to Bulgaria, the Greek system has become the import route for Bulgarian gas consumers. And therefore, we have had the need to immediately maximize our ability to flow gas from Greece to Bulgaria in reverse flow. And this is not only within the limit of our technical firm capacity, which is 64 gigawatt hour per day, meaning 2.3 billion cubic meters per year, but much above, as you can see, in many days, through interruptible products, we are able to export much more than our firm capacity. Um, of course, this is also a strong indication that there is a, an increased need to export through Greece, of course. We have had auction of capacity that have been overbooked many, many times, and we took, let's say, one month more or less to close the auction. Uh, what we are doing a little bit perspe uh, in perspective, of course, uh, uh, let's say some uh, reactions have been uh, immediate reaction as i said uh, of course in, we have uh, increased as our ability to export also by a 12 percent increase of our gasification capacity of revitus and uh, we have uh, uh, let's say increased our storage capacity in revitus by the addition of a floating storage unit because this uh, has uh, reduced a bottleneck of the system that is uh, the capacity the storage of, of lng in the of course, these are initiatives that can be done in a very short term. Some of other initiatives are those that are planned or have been planned even more recently. And in particular, uh, let's say what is going on today is uh, an acceleration that, have, have, that has uh, about everything which has to do with compressor stations. So 
we are investing and we will invest even more in increase our ability to pump the gas through the system from south to north. And to give you some numbers, today, as I said, we have a firm capacity of 2.3 BCM to Bulgaria. When the Amelia compressor station will be completed uh, around the end of 23, beginning 24, this will go up to 3.5 BCM per year on the Revitus to CD Orchestra uh, route. In parallel with the, the connection between uh, Alexandropolis IGB and our compressor station, in the east part of the country, another 3 BCM route will be unlocked. So meaning that 2.3, 3.5, 6.5 BCM. And uh, there is a, a project that we have submitted as part of Repower EU for an expansion, which is quite limited. And we have been discussing um, also with the uh, Vulcan gas, but also with IGB, Vulcan Transgas. So uh, uh, this will bring uh, to additional 2 BCM. Therefore, uh, let's say we will be we will more than triple the existing capacity from 2.3 to 8.5 BCM. And this is something that is already largely planned and ongoing. Of course, uh, let's say uh, uh, there is a, a lot of emphasis on new import infrastructure, absolutely positive, absolutely needed, but then we need to have uh, a sufficient capacity in the system that allow this gas to flow, this LNG to reach the market. And our system, as it is today, has reached his saturation. So with this compressor station, we will reach the maximum and we will not be able to accommodate really other transit flows unless we develop further pipeline capacity. And of course, this is a big new challenge. And in this respect, uh, of course, we have a big project of, uh, sorry, of. I apologize, I'm trying to come back, but is, <laughs> I'm doing the wrong way. There is a, a, a big new project of transit toward, Bulga toward North Macedonia, where we hope pretty soon to be able to announce that we will move forward with the construction because we will should close the market test by next Monday. Uh, and uh, this will, of course, increase also the diversification of supply on a new country, uh, North Macedonia. But... Uh, Coming back to the need of strengthening somehow the internal highways to avoid congestion in the highways, what we have been proposing now to the European, through the Greek government, to the European Commission, through the Power EU initiative, is the strengthening of the grid. Because only through the strengthening of the grid, as I said, it will be possible to accommodate additional import facilities, additional FSRUs uh, on top of the one, uh, the Revitusa and the, the current Alexandropolis project, because otherwise uh, we have no sufficient capacity to ship more volumes. Uh, these, of course, are big projects, a big project that have uh, uh, for us uh, a strategic uh, characteristic, being that they will be 100% hydrogen ready, but at the same time, our project that requires uh, are financially uh, intensive and require visibility about what is the energy policy of, of Europe. Because uh, you can imagine that we are talking about a larger scale investment in the context in which we have two conflicting messages. We need to run to build a new infrastructure to the, the diversify sources of supply. But Europe will reduce uh, gas consumption of 123 BCM by 2030. But all the power plants are up, uh, coal power plants are up and running. So, of course, you can imagine that as a, a, let's say a private company, but uh, looking at financial investors, the banks, the private investors, how can you invest with these uncertainties? So it's very, very important that at European and national level, we have an energy policy that gives a coherent message. These infrastructure are needed. Yes, absolutely, to diversify the security of supply. These infrastructure are going to be used. Yes, we think so, because we'll be also hydrogen ready. But we cannot continue to pass messages that are contradictory. Otherwise, uh, let's say, uh, of course, this will, uh, instead of accelerate, create more uncertainty and delay projects, which are very important. Sorry. It would not have been very much to the, to the point, uh, Maria Rita, because uh, this is the oxymoron that we are uh, also observing from outside that, uh, you know, you, 
you have some signals from the market that you need to go fast and uh, you need to move into upgrading infrastructure, which takes uh, hundreds of millions, uh, if not billions, in terms of what uh, kind of infrastructure we're talking about. And uh, this decision needs to be get taken today with a view for 20, 30 years uh, down the line. So this this is the, 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 the uh, tricky point that uh, uh, we need to see. Um, now I, I will move to uh, Mr. Daniel Bustos, the Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer of Accelerate uh, Energy, uh, and uh, ask you again in, in the midst of this uh, energy crisis uh, boosted mostly from the Russian invasion and the uh, threats, the threat from Russia to, to cut the gas supplies, let's say, in any case of a, a European reaction on that. Uh, do you believe that we have uh, room for more um, uh, similar uh, LNG slash FSRU infrastructure uh, in uh, in Europe, in uh, our region? And, uh, you know, how fast uh, can this be implemented? And uh, what is your take also following the last comment by uh, Maria Rita in terms of investment at the end of the day and financial closing of this kind of projects? Oh, absolutely. And thank you very much for, for the invitation. This is my first time in this event. I hope it's not the last one. It would be great for Accelerate to, to keep sharing our thoughts and ideas with the market. In a brief introduction, because Accelerate Energy has not been very well known in, in Europe for the simple reason that for over 20 years, we've been doing exactly what Europe is needed now, but in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Argentina, Israel, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, even New England, which is bring flexible access to LNG around the world. And what Accelerate does is exactly that. We are not an LNG producer. We do everything after the LNG is produced. We transport, we regasify, we build flexible infrastructure for our customers. And we also procure LNG and sell natural gas to our customers, adapting the contracts and adapting the structure of not only the procurement, but of the capacity to the customer needs. And the customer needs very different things and from very long-term contracts that we have in Bangladesh, 15, 20 years, to very flexible products like we have in Brazil, for example. And when I see Europe, I see a need of bringing together two critical points that what I believe the reason is, is playing catch up. The security of supply, of course, and also the need of transition into net zero, which are not competing needs. They are complementary and they should be seen as complementary. And how do we see this when we talk to our customers and we see the same in Europe? Customers usually look at three aspects for energy. The supply, the access to the supply, and how flexible the product is going to be. And I'm going to say something that is going to sound a little bit odd these days. Worldwide, there isn't a supply issue in terms of energy. Natural gas has never been cheaper, less risky to produce, more flexible to produce in the world. There's no peak gas in the world. Renewables have never been cheaper. Hydrogen is breaking records of cost every day. We have a crisis of access to energy. And that's what we have to deal with. When you see all the companies, governments, trying to come up together with solutions, they're facing the issue that everything that we knew about our plants have changed. And it didn't change with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. It changed before. We, we had the unique opportunity of going public in April 2022. So we started talking to the investors before the invasion, and we ended up going public after the invasion. And you could hear the, the confusion on the market. And one of the things that we said was that Europe had the first crisis of the energy transition before the invasion. And when we talk about crisis, we talk about affordability. And it's an incredibly important element on all these discussions. We want to bring back public companies, private companies, affordability and flexibility to the system. And how do we do that? We need to sophisticate the relationship between 
the providers, and the market. And I'm going to give you a specific example of that. In Albania, we are developing an LNG to power project. We are going to develop the infrastructure in partnership with the Albanian government to connect our terminal to TAP. We will not seek to have 100% long-term contracted capacity. Our business model goes to try to get the minimal amount to facilitate the investment and then to provide the flexibility to the system. The benefit that that brings to the whole region is immense. We're going to be connecting right before TAP goes under the Adriatic. What that means is that physically, when you look at all the territories, everything that is done for a molecule coming from Azerbaijan to make it to Europe, there are multiple risks there. And I'm not talking necessarily about political risks. There are technical issues. There can be even a union disruptions. You name it. The deal risk that we bring with our terminal is enormous. When you look at the way capacity and gas sales are contracted, that part is not appreciated. Of course, as a private company, I can bet on that, and we will, to, to a certain extent, of course. But I wonder how many other projects could come to fruition, and, and I think that they will come. We will, we will see more FSR use, not in the very short term due to availability, but there will be more flexible projects coming. That's one of the critical points that we see, how we make it flexible, and particularly how we have the honest discussion particularly with the renewable sector and policymakers, the renewables will bring the cheapest, cleanest energy to the table. But if we don't have the flexibility to minimize the risk of disruptions, we're going to see us ourselves again on the situation that we are today. And we are not only in Europe, we're around the world. And I can tell you, the Bangladeshi government, the Pakistani government, they're not only afraid that they will not be able to increase their demand, they're afraid that their contracts will not be fulfilled. And there have been some very unfortunate events of contracts not being fulfilled. And they feel that Europe is going to take back that, which we know is not the case. We know that Europe, Europe's goal is not to stop the energy transition around the world. That's part of the agenda that we want to bring on the table. In December, we're going to be starting regasification in Finland. Just an example of flexibility. The vessel that we're taking to Finland till September 1st was covering the winter peak demand in Argentina. In mid 2022, we expect to deliver a vessel, the fifth FSRU to Germany. That vessel is today in another market providing security of supply. So when we think about the infrastructure and when we think about the investment decisions, Europe will never be disassociated with the rest of the world. And it's not a good idea to start going, moving backwards on that. I think we can work together to make sure that Europe does receive affordable, flexible energy so we can all keep betting on net zero. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. It was, uh... Very good what you said about flexibility. I definitely agree with that. And, uh, you know, FSRUs, LLG in general gives that flexibility, necessary flexibility. We need to price this flexibility and see how this can then become a, a viable investment opportunity. And, you know, with what we are seeing today, this is the case. Maybe a couple of years ago it was not the case. And this is what we need to remind all the time, both politicians, because maybe in certain cases you need subsidization to do that, to enable this kind of a very... Uh, 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 say important pieces of infrastructure to be enabled. But uh, another point that I would like to mention, and I will, um, uh, because we don't have a lot of time to go through a proper set of uh, questions, let's say, with uh, each one of you, uh, I will ask your opinion, a couple of uh, words, if you can, uh, each one of you, regarding um, uh, what we have heard so far. Uh, I wanted to mention the taxonomy, and maybe Ms. Pirati can tell us a little bit about that. and how this can work with what Maria Rita has been saying earlier in terms of uh, maybe supporting European infrastructure, that there's no clear visibility, you know, what is happening next. Uh, and the, the, the notion of the security of supply for LNG, because another big issue we're not discussing, it's okay, we're bidding all these FSRUs, but 
you know, to bring the LNG, you need the source of LNG. And uh, what we have seen as a, a savior so far, let's say, for Europe has been the US LNG. But uh, there is a big uh, discussion even happening now in the United States about the concentration of this supply of uh, global LNG effectively coming from the US in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, we may have a storm and we know that this is happening maybe once every other year. We have a major disruption in a lot of these power plants and uh, we have seen that uh, also happening with uh, the recent uh, uh, accident that we had in one of these uh, units, uh, which is shut down uh, for a few months and over the summer there were disruptions. That's why prices also jumped a lot uh, uh, globally, effectively, it would be because of the whole demand of uh, energy that we have been seeing around. And so what do you think can be the solution? Okay, maybe Germany has five LNG terminals like FSRUs. Maybe we have three here. Europe might be full of FSRUs, but we need to have the source as well. So what do you see about that also? Start? Yes. Well, I think that the main parameters in this uh, discussion and in this crisis is to provide the stability and predictability to the markets. And the main case for this is that's why we, we adapt during last plenary in Strasbourg uh, in July, the second uh, taxonomy delegated act, which is in a way officially says that the, the mid-term solution for uh, the issue of security of supply is gas and also is nuclear. And in this regard, it is important to say that uh, we lack of infrastructure, particularly in the area, and we have to, to, to provide to the, to the investors the, the, the clear signal that now there are a lot of opportunities to start working in order to update the pipelines, in order to have the proper infrastructure. Allow me to say that we face the danger for having stranded assets. And that's why this kind of infrastructure must be hydrogen ready. And that's why this kind of infrastructure must be oriented to our final goal, which is to decarbonize our economy by 2050. And by saying this, I would like to remind that uh, we in the parliament, we are now getting into the last phase of, uh, of uh, saying yes to Red 3, on which I am the rapporteur on behalf of MV Committee of PPP, we are setting a very ambitious and very important target, target for 2030. It is a mid-term target. It's for 45% to our energy mix and renewables. I think renewables is the future. Renewables is the key in order to, to decrease our dependency from different uh, sources and from, from natural gas. And also renewables is the key for our country Greece providing that we will provide stability and predictability to the market and also increase the so-called public acceptance on which we face a lot of obstacles when we start uh, uh, deploying renewables here in Thessaloniki as well. Olga, comment from you? I think if we uh, learn anything from this current crisis is overbuilding, uh, you know, should really be the last of our concerns that we look into the future. Um, sure, this geopolitical crisis, the horrible war in Ukraine that Russia started, you know, some countries, in some, specifically in Central and Eastern Europe, were warning about this kind of risk level, maybe not this level of aggression, but there was a reason why certain countries were diversifying and building out new connectors for the last several decades, right? But there, I, I wanted to talk about risks that we have not anticipated yet that could come on the horizon in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, several of us, of the speakers mentioned the impacts of climate change uh, and what that's already doing to some of the energy supplies, even um, things like nuclear, where, you know, the, the rivers are too hot to be able to cool things off. And that, that's not across the entire industry, but in a couple of countries, that, that is already an issue. Even existing sources like coal, the drought um, is stopping some of those deliveries or hampering some of those deliveries. So unfortunately, we're going to see... <laughs> An exacerbation of these kinds of impacts on how our energy is utilized, how uh, how it's transferred, transmitted, and um, how it's produced. So, I don't think I think we need to be really smart and try to learn from the past. Of you can never really overbuild as you look into security uh, for the next several decades. And but also keeping the climate objections in, in mind and in trying to, and having a path towards how do these sources then are married to the climate goals what is you know what what is the path to whether it's hydrogen what is the path to zero lng what does that even mean because in some some companies or some stakeholders zero net net zero lng that means just buying a lot of offsets and that will you know that's a whole different conversation you know that could be a part of the solution sure um and for some it's really focusing a lot more on reducing emissions right there at source and then you know methane reduction or CCUS, uh, it's probably a combination of all of these things, right? But I think 
how can we learn from the last several decades in the situation that we're doing right now? There's still going to be a lot of unpredictable things happening, both man-made and uh, nature made that, you know, was exacerbated by climate change in our actions in the last several decades. So keeping, keeping that in mind and keeping in mind growing need for a better lifestyle, more complex energy demand, not just in Europe, but across the world. And now we see how growth for demand in Asia and other countries that pulls strength for the overall pricing and supply chain, right? So we don't live in a vacuum. So just keeping all of that in mind as we try to build a more comfortable world, world uh, for ourselves. And even just in the short term, thinking about switching over from coal, which needs to happen as soon as possible. Of course, it's being utilized right now for energy security purposes. And so it should be to keep the lights on, keep essential services going, keep the industry. But if you think about the level of electrification that needs to happen uh, in order for us to even like, that's a free step to some of the decarbonization of the industry of transport and all the other sectors. Um, you know, that electricity has to come from somewhere. And yes, let's scale up renewables to the point that we can. Let's add batteries and let's have all these solutions. But let's not forget about how do we, you know, how do we diversify and invest in the infrastructure that we'll need. So. Yeah, but until we reach that point, we have to face uh, the short term, mid term crisis. Uh, and we have to face 40% of the gas supply uh, of Europe um, being uh, banished or not being there anymore um, because of the choice. Uh, and we need to think how we replace that. And um, yes, there is a, an issue of uh, um, shortness in, in LNG supply and this uh, will continue until 26, 27. Um, so we need to move things in parallel. But, but there are now um, plans for development of new energy production. Um, it's, it's not going to happen in, in one or two years, but we should look at 2027 probably uh, before we can actually cover uh, potentially through LNG, uh, the gap uh, of, of Russian gas. And that's in combination with all um, other uh, measures that we are talking about. And in this context, uh, unless you develop in parallel the infrastructure, not just for the reception, but also for the transmission, uh, so you can achieve full utilization of your input facilities, you're not going to solve the problem. So that's, you need to do things timely. You need to do time is of critical importance now. It happened, it happened so that um, this year I was traveling a lot. Uh, traveling a lot uh, twice to the States, Mideast, uh, uh, Azerbaijan, that reason, Turkmenistan, all around. Uh, and um, going straight to your question, uh, there are a lot of uh, projects, which uh, is correctly mentioned, uh, liquefaction terminals, uh, new sources of, uh, of natural gas around the world, alternatives to the Russian one, which will happen. Of course, uh, we in the uh, energy business and the gas business know that it's not it's a time taking process uh, from uh, even before reaching the FID and then uh, having the project implemented. So uh, in the midterm uh, from now, let's say three to four years, um, there will be a lot of, uh, of uh, liquefied natural gas which could uh, reach uh, Europe and, uh, and our region. So, and supporting the idea of costs, we should be prepared about that. We shouldn't lose our time. So this is, uh, how to say that this is the midterm solution, which uh, I see from a, a business perspective, uh, from a consumer's perspective, it's, it's doable. And uh, we have, let's say, a common agreement about that. Uh, about the long term, having the, let's say, the, the green energy policy, 
of course, uh, in cooperation, it was mentioned by Maria, we, are, we, we even together, we are working about uh, um, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen, uh, fully hydrogen already projects. And uh, even uh, in this midterm uh, period, uh, we had to start the blending of, uh, of hydrogen and, and natural gas in our systems. Of course, increasing on a, on a constant basis uh, the percentage of, of hydrogen. So the future of in our business, uh, it's uh, it will be totally dedicated to, to hydrogen for sure. So changing the values of natural gas and uh, and hydrogen. But the, the real the real challenge, which is well known even from both sides, from our side and from the Russian side is how we're going to survive this short-term period. So there, the, the word which I would like to use is solidarity. So just to get a support when each of the market, when, okay, we have a gas storage, Greece is having uh, the LNG terminal, so we could share that. Sharing uh, and solidarity. Thank you, Marielta. Well, if I may, let's say, start with a, an optimistic view when you ask about security supply and with LNG, I think that, uh, and I agree with you, that there is abundance of natural gas in the world, that the technology for liquefaction is mature. So now, and uh, the cost of liquefaction can be, let's say, very much optimized. So we can come back to a world in which, uh, let's say, the prices of natural gas come back to the normality in some years and have reliable sources of LNG. Uh, what uh, I think is also important, and uh, Vladimir mentioned that the topic of storage is also to highlight, but is to highlight that uh, the demand for LNG is heavily concentrated in the northern hemisphere. The production is not seasonal, and uh, the production of LNG is much more rigid than the production than when you import the gas via pipes. Uh, and the import infrastructure, and I have to say. A bit, the FSRU have this rigidity of having no storage, so the need to regasify ship in order to be able to take the next one. Highlight uh, the importance of having storage. Because the more you depend on LNG, the more if you live in the northern hemisphere, you need the storage. You need it for seasonal needs, you need it for getting better prices in the summer. You needed to balance the, the, the market when, uh, you, the, you know, the demand does not correspond to the input from the terminals. So when we think about an energy system and we change some part of the equation, we cannot forget to change others. So now, if you, uh, Europe, many European countries have an abundance of storages. Uh, so they can certainly afford many more FSRUs. Mm. Greece don't have storage. And this is a problem if you want to increase dependence on LNG. And I'm happy that we can share some of the storage in Bulgaria, but uh, I mean, it's not in, it even expanded, it's still a small one. So it's something that we need to consider. Otherwise, we will face a moment in which we have a lot of LNG and we have a lot of operational issues. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, yes, then. Yes. Um, I think a point, and I've heard that before when people are saying bringing FS reuse is easy, bringing the LNG is hard. Uh, and that's correct, but at the same time, it is very relevant, and Europe has benefited of this in the past, to recognize the value of the flexibility of regasification together with appropriate storage. Not all the countries have the same situation, I fully agree. The ideal situation is not one where any regasification capacity is used all the time. It makes no sense. We can do it during a time. We can do it when there's not availability of renewables or when there's a cross-border issue. Of course, that's a value of the security. But for the European Union and the rest of Europe to expect that only regasification is valuable when it's in high utilization, it actually betrays the concept of being a partner for renewables and being security of supply. My expectation is, yes, it's going to be difficult to acquire LNG for now. We're going to have a long tail of substantially higher utilization 
of all the import capacity, not necessarily if they are used for quite a few years. And then Europe will be Europe. Renewables are going to keep coming back. There are going to be more investments in upstream in Europe. And the regas capacity should go back to be what it should be. It's a seasonal support and it's a security of supply. But if we convince our people, the citizens, that if a regas terminal is not used 100%, it's a waste of money, that would be a shame. Those regas terminals are the best partners for renewal because they pay for the insurance. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, join me in applauding the, our panel for the excellent discussion that we have. And, uh, We will immediately move to the next panel with Ms. Eleftheriades from Deloitte, who will be chairing the next discussion.